Good evening. Welcome to Meet the Artist. My name is Diana Suttle. I'm an art consultant and curator. At one time, you said something to me that is always uh, stuck in my mind. Uh, you said that good artwork or great artwork should always put one in a state of awe. Can you elaborate on that, please? Well, yes. Uh, that statement comes from a context uh, that has to do with what is the proper function of art. You know, art in the service of what? And uh, the proper function of art is not to be in the service of something that creates a reference to anything outside of the frame of art. And what that means is, for instance, uh, art should not create desire, for instance. Uh, you have a picture of a lovely uh, children playing on the beach, and you say, isn't that lovely? I would love to be on that beach with those children. That's desire. Uh, you have a picture of a guy driving a Mustang convertible, and he sees a lovely girl on the corner, and you think, oh, I'd like to buy that Mustang and meet a girl like that. That's desire. Uh, you could say that all advertising art is in the service of desire. Advertising is, in a sense, pornography. Mm -hmm. The other idea is that art evokes movement in the other direction, away. You re you're recoiled, you're uh, frightened by it, you're di disgusted by it, you're reviled by it. Uh, this is also movement outside of the frame of reference of the art. Uh, so the proper function of art then is to hold you in a state of aesthetic arrest. Because when you're moved to desire or to loathing or fear, you're here in the world. And the proper function of art should be to take you beyond the temporal experience mm -hmm. and hold you in a state of awe, as you said, where there is the possibility of being in a state of awe in relation to the radiance of the art. Mm -hmm. uh, you are the universal subject and your eyes are beholding the universal object and the radiance of the object comes through. And wow, you know, what an experience. And that's the aesthetic experience. And, and that's, that's really the uh, meaning behind that statement. Oh, okay. I know that that has always been in my mind. I can always remember you saying that, and it has a great influence on me when I look at a painting. Um, but I feel, by observing your, at, by observing your artwork, um, that your approach is quite intellectual in that you integrate different scientific theories with a very meticulous and sometimes structural or chaotic line depending upon the energy of the painting. Um, your work to me is always a constant reminder of mankind's greatness in the human pursuit of spirituality. Um, I. I'm just curious, what exactly or who exactly inspired you to become an artist? Well, I've been naturally uh, drawn to art ever since I was a child. So it, it was maybe innate? It's, it's, it's completely innate, uh -huh. you know. Uh, and uh, I don't know why, I was 10 years old, I came to America. And I just loved abstract art, and I wanted to see uh, Jackson Pollock and all the abstract artists, and and I love jazz music, and uh, so I think that part of it is just my nature. It's just my makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, p the inspiration comes from you know the natural part of myself, but in addition to that, it comes from. Uh, I wanted to make art, and what kind of art do I want to make, and I wanted to understand. I wanted to get this very clear in my mind. Uh, what kind of art should an artist make? What kind of uh, usefulness for making art is there in, in the world? And uh, I had to find, of course, the motivation 
and the passion in the kind of art I make that would keep me going, mm -hmm. that, that could sustain my commitment to it. Mm -hmm. and, and I found that by learning to understand the underlying spiritual value of art. And uh, in my uh, studies and research, uh, I found that many artists throughout history had this link. Uh, painters, dancers, uh, and of course, it links back even further than that. It links back to prehistoric times. It links back to the times when all art was mythological. All art was spiritual. Mm -hmm. And art was not for decoration, nor was it for sale. It is a shared experience of the community, mm -hmm. and the art speaks for the value system and the belief system by which the community lives. It's not something they just think about. They actually live by this. Uh, and when I found that connection uh, for myself in my art, uh, it gave it the kind of meaning that allowed me to continue with a uh, uh, passion. Okay. Thanks for answering. I, I always wondered about that. You've described your work as, quote, symbolic paintings that represent the new mythology for a scientific age. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, uh, once having discovered my relationship and understanding and appreciation of the uh, mythic element mm -hmm. uh, in art historically mm -hmm. throughout human history, mm -hmm. uh, I realized that the mythologies, you know, are metaphors. Uh, the paintings are metaphors. A metaphor is, you know, stands for something that is the same as. Mm -hmm. uh, mythological metaphors are the belief systems. For instance, all religions are metaphors. Dreams are metaphors. I mean, you wouldn't interpret a dream literally. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we've all come to understand that a dream is a symbolic imagery. Dreams, as well as mythology, come from the human collective unconscious. Uh, and it's only of value when it is representative of the collective, mm -hmm. not the personal. Uh, the personal has nothing to do with it. Uh, whatever you do has to relate to the human experience, the collective human experience, not personal statements. And so uh, artists have been the makers of mythic images throughout human history. And today, in modern contemporary society, where we have no mythology, if you take the spiritual, the mystical element out of mythology, what you have left is ideology. And that's what we have all over the world today, ideology, ideological interpretations of symbolic ideas that stand for something else, but they're being read as signs, not as symbols. They're being taken in the denotative context rather than the connotative meaning. Mm -hmm. And people are dying. And it's, it's a bizarre and frightening aspect of uh, the world today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so artists, I think, are the people who can uh, connect get in touch with eternal truths mm -hmm. that are common to the context of all human experience that represent the collective unconscious experience and bring that through in a contemporary idiom and to, to create the kind of imagery that can speak of eternal truths to contemporary society in, in the current context in which we live. Well, with that said, uh, what is there a particular process that you go through before you start a painting? Well, to, to... And there is, and uh, of course, the pro on the one hand, you could say the process continues with me all the time. It's uh -huh. part of my daily life. But when I prepare to do work, of course, clearing the mind is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, I take time. Uh, to just to be in my environment, my workspace, and uh, to uh, you know rid myself 
of the concerns of uh, the job and the mm -hmm. other activities of the day of the world sure. and to get in touch and uh, and uh, that's you know reaching the the silence within you know there is a point value of inner silence where people who talk a lot mm -hmm. can't hear others and people who are always talking to themselves can't hear themselves and so this idea of silence is to quiet down the spontaneous mind stuff and get in touch with that part of yourself where you can hear yourself and if you hear yourself you will also hear the universal creative uh, field resonating within you mm -hmm. and so that's the process well, you know, your, your ideas, your philosophy is always, has always been so fascinating to me. And I'm, I'm just very curious um, with the way that you think, um, exactly what, what do you feel is going on in the contemporary art world today? Well, um, What do you think needs to, to yeah, be changed? What of, direction do well, you feel that it's going in? Well, I, I feel it's certainly not going in the direction that I perceive. Uh -huh. Uh, although there are individuals in the art world who are addressing these issues, they're aware of them, uh, but they're not getting any recognition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, you know, I'm against any form of censorship. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say that. And I don't think there should be anyone or anything that dictates what art is or can be. Uh, but with no censorship, shouldn't there be a sense of responsibility? Well, I think there should be a sense of awareness okay. of the transformations of human consciousness mm -hmm. which are taking place at many levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, uh, you know, part of the problem is that artists today go to college, you know, they go to a university and mm -hmm. they take psychology classes and sociology classes and environmental classes and so on and uh, I think a lot of uh, p people come out of the universities as artists and they think well you know if I align myself with one of these social based movements uh -huh. or issues then uh, of course the issue is important so if I make art about it my art will also be important mm -hmm. but of course it's not really uh, creating a transforming experience uh, for the anyone who sees the art or for society it, um, <clears throat> and uh, so that's what we have you know we have really merely a, re a reflection of the temporal experience rather than uh, any doors or windows being open to a transcendent mm -hmm. awareness or experience artists are like mystics except the mystic doesn't have a craft Mm -hmm. and our craft holds us to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, a mystic goes off in his psyche to mm -hmm. some experience mm -hmm. and that's where he goes and often it's where he stays. Mm -hmm. uh, the artist has to bring this something back to the studio and then through the practice of his craft the artist has to learn to refine their own inner sensibilities mm -hmm. and, uh, and you have to refine your own spirit so to speak mm -hmm. it's almost like an internal cleansing process by which you uh, come to terms with whatever mystical experience you may have had so it's a psychological journey kind of like a hero's journey you go off beyond the boundaries of your society uh, beyond the edge and you experience something and you bring something back and then now you have to work in your studio with your craft and uh, present it to the world and make it visible in some way to the world and and I think that's the deepest application of art I think hmm. I read a review about an artist whose work I thought was great and, and the reviewer said the work seems too positive for our times uh, it's really interesting that at a time in the world when we've reached maximum capabilities in technologically, scientifically, uh, economically, materially, that people are running around depressed. And uh, I think it's because the mythological guidelines 
for how to live a meaningful life are absent. We have ideology. Yes, th that ties in very well with my, my next thought, actually. I, I, you, know, I, you know, there are many great contemporary artists that I very much admire, but so often I come across artists who produce nothing but depressing and disturbing work. It seems to be an undying trend in the contemporary art world. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, it, well, I not only, un, unfortunately it's undying, although in many ways I think it's already dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, the avant-garde, in my opinion, is finished. Mm -hmm. The avant-garde is over. Mm -hmm. it, it died from sheer exhaustion. <laughs> uh, Marcel Duchamp was basically the first artist who realized, you know, I can gain recognition and bring attention to myself as an artist, not by making great art, but merely by making an avant-garde statement, like putting a urinal in the museum and calling in a fountain. Mm -hmm. And that kind of set a trend in motion. And of course, the first few people who did it, it was unique, it was different, it uh, created a kind of intellectual uh, consideration about what art could be or should be, and, and that was kind of fun, but it's exhausted. But what we have, again, is the universities, generation after generation of uh, art instructors and professors teaching what they learned, who were taught what they, their professors learned. And so it's a continuum, and no one has stopped to question it. And it's very interesting to me because I realize that starvation, war, bigotry, violence is an ever-present part of the world that we live in. But I often wonder if it's always necessary to make those uh, factors the main focus in the art society. So why isn't it sort of redundant for an artist to, be, new, to, to be talking about the same thing when I feel that, an, I, I personally feel that an artist should yeah. put uh, humankind on a, on a higher level. You know. Well, precisely. It's not only redundant, uh -huh. but again, it's uh, art that is in the service of something else. If yes. you want to do journalism about yes. the human condition, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, violence and war and poverty and all of that has been with us for at least three million mm -hmm. years that mm -hmm. we know about. Mm -hmm. It's not likely to go away mm -hmm. unless society uh, transforms its consciousness. Mm -hmm.